it's cool to hear. I recognize a lot of companies uh, that I've never like talked to in person, but online I've talked to quite a few of you, I think. And it's cool to like hear your names and stuff, like the Riot Games people, Expedia, stuff like that. It's pretty cool. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about uh, building automated dev environments with Vagrant. And I wasn't quite sure what the level of this like meetup was going to be with the rise of Vagrant. So this is a pretty elementary talk. So if you're used to using Vagrant on an, a daily basis, it could be a little boring, but we're going to focus on the high level, like why you need Vagrant, the problems it solves, how you should use it, stuff like that. I won't be covering too much of the newer like stuff that's out there, except to tell you that it exists, um, but won't be going into detail of how it works and stuff like that. So hopefully that's OK. But if not, then ask me afterwards, and I can talk you about it. might have a Q&A session afterwards. Yeah, there's a Q&A too. So if you have any like specific advanced questions, I'm happy to answer it. Um, OK, so I'm Mitchell Hashimoto. Um, this slide's a little redundant, but it has my Twitter handle and stuff. In case you want to like talk to me, that's the easiest way. Pretty addicted. Um, and I build tools. So I started my own company in November, and I'm just focusing on building ops tools. That includes Vagrant and some other stuff. So that's what I've been doing full time, and it's awesome. And so let's just dive right into it. So who here, first of all, who here uses Vagrant? I'm actually curious. Well, shit. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So a lot of you already use it, so I don't know if this is a little redundant. But um, let's just start with the problem that they're solving why it exists. Um, maybe it'll be educational for the people who use it. So the main problem is, is you start with this quote, which is happens at every company. If someone says, hey, you're hired. Here's some like shiny new $2,000 machine. Let's get you up and running on it um, so that your paycheck's worth it like really quickly. So you get this machine. And let's walk through like what typically happens when you're hired. So you clone something at some startup. and you do something, once you clone it out of some repo, you do, there's some steps involved. Um, that's specifically what we're gonna, that's really hard to read, that's specifically what we're gonna look at. These steps are like, explode out into like 100 steps usually. Um, and then the idea is after you're done with those steps, you have the full site up and running. So at that start shell point, whatever that means for you, you could access like any service or any feature of whatever you're building at that time. Um, but we're going to look specifically at these three dots and, and what they mean and what could be happening there. So scenario one is you have a setup script. And this is like the GitHub. GitHub still does this a little bit. Um, but this is the idea that you will check it out, run some scripts, and it sets everything up for you. And then at the end of that, you'll be good to go. Uh, but this has problems, like a lot of problems, actually. So one, your Mac is not what is running in production. So you're installing software that's compiled differently, has different flags on, like all sorts of different stuff. Some stuff doesn't even compile on, on whatever platform you're using to develop on. Um, yeah, so it's unlikely that all the software works the same way. Uh, there's a lot of differences that, these are like subtle bugs that will catch you like way down the line. Um, it's unlock unlikely the software will be configured the same. So you know, Apache configurations, database configurations, some of those things are super important to get right um, and again lead to really subtle bugs later which are effectively, hey, this thing worked on my machine and I pushed it to production and then suddenly it's not working the way I expected. And it's usually because, oh, like that Apache module isn't enabled and somehow you have it on in your thing or, you know, something like that. Uh, it requires special maintenance and this is kind of the key thing uh, because the, the deep thought here is it's way easier to do nothing than it is to do something else. So if this requires special maintenance, then eventually it's going to drop out of, you know, up out of sync with production, and you're going to end up with this mess that probably doesn't work. Like maybe you go through two months where you don't hire someone, a lot changes in two months, and then your setup script doesn't work anymore, and that sucks. And what if people want to work in Windows or Linux or something like? Do you maintain separate shell scripts for, or setup scripts for all these platforms? Or do you force people, when you hire them, to use the platform that you want to use? Um, it sucks. You could do whatever, but it sucks the other way. And, and that's pretty much the problems with scenario one. So I think we've all seen the setup script at some point, or all thought it was a good idea at some point. Like, oh, we could automate this with a shell script. Um, but there's some problems. But some people still do it. Uh, the next thing is the Uber README. I like this one because this is what I used to do before Vagrant. And I pulled a project like last night with an Uber README. 
Um, it's GitLab. So we have GitLab, which is an awesome project, but they have and they have a Vagrant integration. So if you use Vagrant, then you could get it up and running instantly. But if you don't have Vagrant, you got this thing. And so let's just go through it. This is how you get started with it. Yeah. Problems. <laughs> So that I mean that's a pretty I think GitLab's a pretty typical example of a, a mature project that is likely to exist in in a startup or something like your web project. It's not overly simple. It's not like a basic Rails app. Um, it's actual like thing that's meant to be run in production that has complicated components and stuff like that. So you'll end up with something like that. And this is super common too. Uh, this is extremely prone to user error. It's basically you're trusting that whatever human is going to run your, or, or read through your readme is going to set everything up properly. Um, more importantly, I think you're trusting devs that they're going to properly do all the ops. And DevOps is cool, but like a lot of times your dev people aren't ops people. So you're just trusting that they're going to get that right, and that's unlikely. Um, and it's, I mean, the, it's not verifiable that it's correct. So like once they get it working, you're not really sure that it actually works. Like it appears to work, but you're not actually sure that every piece is correct, and that's a pretty major problem. Uh, heavy maintenance on this one. Maintaining English is really hard for programmers, so like keeping the README up to date with every moving component is just unlikely to happen. Um, again, especially if you're not hiring people or something, then it's going to fall out of, of being up to date, and that happens all the time. Uh, and it's just hard. It's hard. It's time consuming. So this is the one that, this is what I was, uh, I tried to set up scripts and stuff, but this is actually what ticked me off enough to like build Vagrant uh, three or four years ago was basically every project I worked on had a huge readme. Um, and for some reason, when I was setting up the readmes, they were in billable hours. So, <laughs> so I would spend like four hours sometimes setting up a project. Not because installing the software took that long, but sometimes, but mostly just getting it right to where things appeared to work. Um, and it was just a waste of my time because I wasn't really being paid for it. Uh, and that, that's, even if you are getting paid for it, it's a waste of time. Like you have these high paid engineers and they're not, they're wasting their time setting things up rather than like committing code, which is what you want. And again, it's platform specific. So that README is probably not going to work for Windows or Linux or Mac or whatever other platforms you have. Or if you try to make it work with that, it's going to balloon to like triple the size or, or more. Try to get something running on Windows. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and scenario three is the good luck have fun model. Um, and I, I would say this is the most common thing that happens. That README is actually in, in light of missing anything else, if they didn't have a Vagrant file or if they didn't um, have a setup script, like that readme is better than nothing and the good luck have fun thing is nothing. The idea is you run the, the program and you read the error and then you say like, oh, it failed to connect to MySQL, so let's install MySQL. And then you run it again, it's like, oh, it failed to connect to Redis, so then you install Redis. You know, you continue down this thing, so then you run it again, missing image magic extensions, you install that, and like if you've ever installed Image Magic, you pretty much start to hate yourself at this point because it's impossible. Um, <laughs> and then you run it, and then it seems to run, and so you're super excited, and you're like you're ready to work. And this is probably like an hour into it. Um, so then you load it up in your browser, and it's just like internal server error, <laughs> and something exploded. So then you're pissed, um, and then you read stack traces, and you keep following the steps basically. Stack trace says failed to connect to Redis because it's on the wrong port. So then you start configuring Redis in different ways. Uh, and then eventually it appears to work, but again, it's not really working. Um, and that's, all these three things are just a huge productivity failure at the end of the day. It's all wasted time, it's all repeated work, it's all stuff that computers should be able to automate, um, and it's a huge failure. Um, and the problems associated are really, it's not repeatable, so it's a time sink. It's not verifiably correct, so Everyone appears to be making things working, maybe, but you can't be sure until you basically run the code in production. Um, it's not isolated, so it's fun to set up like GitLab on your computer, then go ahead and try to set up like some really old Rails blog or something that has totally different versions of everything, and you know try to set that up at the same time, and you get conflicts and all sorts of stuff. Uh, it's difficult to understand. No one really knows what's going on. Everyone's kind of a drone and just follows what's happening. And it's slow. And the, that's the biggest part. That's the part that's the most frustrating, for me at least, is that it was slow. Um, so we have to solve these problems. And unsurprisingly, Vagrant, I made Vagrant to solve these problems. 
Um, whether they do or not is your opinion, but I think they do pretty well. So let's talk about Vagrant and how these things get solved. So Vagrant, if you don't know, which is very few of you, but it's a tool for creating, managing, and distributing portable development environments. Um, and this is a, it's, it's, every word in here is super important. It means something, uh, it has a, some meaningful uh, definition. So it creates the environments, it helps you spin them up, spin them down, it manages them, their whole life cycle. It makes them distributable, so once you make them, you can hand them off to other people. They're portable, so they run on Windows, Mac, Linux, um, and they're, they're working environments. And the cool thing about Vagrant, as you all know, is you can just go zero to VM in seconds. So you could, in three commands from, from nothing once Vagrant's installed, you could have a full like sandbox ready to run basically any sort of, in this case, Linux um, environment. And that's super powerful. It's super powerful for a lot of reasons. Um, just right off the bat, it's just basically on-demand sandboxes. When you want to play with some new software or something, you could just spin it up destroy things pretty much and then get rid of it or get another one or something. That's just the surface level. And Vagrant up is the main command that gets everything running, but the, the power of Vagrant is it's a simple, has a simple management interface, it's a CLI. Um, it creates the VMs, uh, that means sets up RAM, sets up hard drives, sets up network stuff, uh, provisions them, installs software, configures software, um, and it has like scripted config of of VM properties like har virtual hardware, um, networks, file systems, stuff like that. Uh, and it's all single command. So with one command, you're kind of up and running without any human interaction, or that's the idea. So going back to our problems, this is repeatable because it's one command to set everything up. It's verifiably correct because you're probably running automation that was developed by an ops person, and they verify it's correct, and it's running in the same environment every time. So as long as computers do the same things repeatedly, then they, which they're pretty good at doing, it's correct. It's isolated, so you're in a virtual machine or you're in some sort of sandbox. Um, so you could actually run some really crazy complicated PHP app over here and then some really crazy complicated Rails app over here that depends on totally different components, and that's fine. And it's understandable, so there's a human readable configuration file if they want it. Uh, if, if developers want to dive in, they can see the ops that's used to create it. Like you could, you could either just run it and you understand what's working, or you could dive deeper and understand how it's working. And it's kind of up to you whether you care, or the devs whether they care, and so on. And it's pretty much as fast as possible. When you're like building virtual machines, of course, it's going to be pretty slow. Like you have to build a full machine, you have to run provisioning stuff. That's not the fast, it's not instant, definitely. But it's definitely much faster than manually doing anything. Um, because that computer's doing it. So you just run it and let it go. So problem solved, pretty much. Like on a, on a, on a high level, those problems are, are solved. Uh, of course, how you implement it and how you use it depends on that w whether you actually solve the problems or not. But you can. So Vagrant is an open source tool. It works on Mac, Windows, and Linux uh, equally well. And supports VirtualBox, VMware, KVM, LXC. These are all the things where it could spin up your sandboxes for you. Uh, and it's mature, it's been around since 2010. Uh, it's been used in production for years now by a ton of companies. Uh, just so you could like, a lot of people just feel better when they see who's using it. I just have this slide. So these are all companies that are actively using Vagrant on a daily basis almost. And some of these companies are here today, so that's cool. It's like Mozilla, Expedia, uh, Edgecast I think is here. Uh, yeah, Tumblr, so technically Yahoo's using it now. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's neat. So, vagrantup.com if you want to like get started with it. I don't recommend doing it on this Wi-Fi, you'll kill something. Um, but that has all the documentation, support, etc. if you want to get going. Um, and that's just kind of the high level, what is Vagrant? So, oh, cool, there's a, there's a Vagrant book it went to the printing press today, so it'll be coming out next week, I think. <laughs> uh, so if you want to learn, this has a pretty good, like, it covers everything that Vagrant has, uh, including, like, plug-in development. So if you want to get going with Vagrant and you feel like paper is better, like some people just like books better, then you could do this. If you're just trying to support me, there's better ways to do that because I only get, like, 
50 cents a book or something. But it's the ebook, it's going to have an ebook too, right? So when we raffle it, you can use it to. Yeah, it has an ebook. Yeah. And I get a dollar for the ebook, not 50 cents. So. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about something I call the Tao of Vagrant. It's basically uh, the reason why Vagrant is so powerful and people latch onto it so much. Um, it's not really the technological things it could do, it's the way you choose to use it, which makes it really powerful. Um, and this is actually pulled out straight from the book, something I wrote for the book. Uh, because a lot of people ask, like, a lot of people have, a, have trouble kind of connecting, like, cool, I like could spin up a VM sandbox to how do I actually integrate this into a team of people. And this kind of answers on a high level what the goals are and how that works. So let's get going. Yes. So from a developer standpoint, the point of Vagrant is developers will, one, check out any project in your entire organization, run Vagrant up, and they're done. Uh, instead of check out any project, whether it's written in whatever language, figure out how to set it up and get working, but developers just learn very quickly that there's one command after checking it out and they're working on whatever technology is running under the hood. Developers continue to work in their own editors, browsers, and other tools. So Vagrant sets up all the you know, shared file systems, networking stuff, everything. So basically, uh, Vagrant just runs code and developers keep working almost the way they're, almost completely the way they're used to using their own tools. And the existence of Vagrant is, is transparent and, and ultimately unimportant to a developer. Um, it's just a means to an end of getting a development environment. Um, and that's how it should be. If there's too much overhead in getting bigger enough and running, the developers won't see any value and they're not gonna really stick with it. So you have to make it, you have to embrace the automation, embrace the one command setup, and really just get things going. From an operations standpoint, you run bigger enough and you have complete sandbox test op scripts. So you set up Vagrant so that when you Vagrant up, you have whatever's running in production, like on an OS level, and then you could use that to sandbox test different configurations, uh, test clusters of things, because Vagrant could do multiple VMs, um, and stuff like that. And the automation developed by the ops is used for both production and development. Um, put this another way, with every Vagrant up, developers get a fully provisioned environment using the same scripts as production. So this means that there's no duplicated effort in maintaining the Vagrant stuff and then maintaining the production stuff. And even there's a lot of people that use Vagrant heavily that still duplicate effort. Like Vagrant improved things because it made things more repeatable, but they're still separately maintaining dev and production stacks pretty much. And the, the I don't know, golden use case of it is you use the same puppet, same chef, maybe with some flags in it, but it's running the same stuff to get the development environment up and running. Like it, an example, a concrete example is maybe in development you disable all the monitoring stuff because that doesn't matter, but it's still running the same chef cookbooks or what have you. And at the end of the day, whether you're systems ops or a developer, you clean up with Vagrant Destroy, Vagrant Suspend, or Vagrant Halt, which does kind of what you would expect those verbs to do. Um, and your computer's clean. There's like, your computer has no trace that it was ever running that stuff or anything because it was isolated. And after that, you vagrant up and you're up and running again at any moment. So the next day, you just vagrant up again and you work. And the cool thing is this knowledge, once you understand this workflow, once you ingrain this workflow in your organization, the knowledge transfers to every project. So as long as you start every project by creating a vagrant file, then every member in your org knows how to dev or test or run that code, basically. They may not know exactly how it works or anything, but they know at least they could get it running and play around with it, and it's just a much lower barrier to entry. Um, and this is really powerful for anybody, but consultancies especially, like every single web project, every client, whether they're working on it or not, they know they could Vagrant up and pull in extra resources, and it's fine. But at the end of the day, Vagrant's a general purpose tool for m running and managing uh, compute resources basically, so you can use it in a way that works best for you, uh, but this Tau idea is kind of what I've found over the years works best for other organizations. And it's purposely pretty general, but it's, it's a best practice sort of thing where I see people mess up. Okay, let's cover the basic principles of Vagrant. I think this is going to not be needed for this crowd, but let's just go over the three main concepts or components that you need to work with Vagrant. So these are pretty much the only 
terminology, the only words you need to know um, that Vagrant introduces to you. So there's boxes, there's a Vagrant file, and then there's a Vagrant command line tool. Uh, put, putting those three verbs in a sentence, uh, the Vagrant command line tool reads a Vagrant file and builds a machine based upon a template that's called a box. And that's, that's all one word, but we'll go one sentence, but we'll go over each one. Boxes. Boxes are templates um, that Vagrant uses to create the running machine. So create, installing an OS and everything is really expensive and uh, pretty like, that step never changes really. So uh, boxes are a way to pre-install stuff that doesn't change and putting it in an image and then coming from there. So that sets, that cuts down the setup time from like five minutes, 10 minutes to 10 seconds, 20 seconds. There's a ton that are publicly available and they're typically right now bare bones. Um, and software is provisioned on top of it. So I provide um, empty Ubuntu images, but there's like a list online of CentOS, uh, Scientific Linux, RHEL, like all that stuff. Whatever you kind of need, and you can make them on your own if you need to. Uh, so, but they could also be custom made. So if you want, you could pre-install everything you want onto the box. And there are organizations that do that. So there are some people who provisioning from scratch will take an hour especially if you're setting up every component to run the website in one VM, it's gonna take an hour or more. And so they um, bake the image with everything they need. And that's fine, you can do that, Vagrant doesn't care. And boxes are completely managed with the Vagrant command line tool. So Vagrant handles adding, installing them, uninstalling them, <coughs> listing them, um, to some degree creating them, um, but not completely. And that's a box. So then there's the Vagrant file. The Vagrant file is per project configuration that's read by Vagrant uh, in order to build your dev environment. It describes machine properties, networks, etc. Basically, it's a single file that describes everything you need to create the running environment. Um, that's everything from RAM on the machine to how you want to access it to what, you know, install Apache and stuff like that. Uh, it's a Ruby DSL, but if you don't know Ruby or you don't want to know Ruby, there's a lot of hostility sometimes. You don't really need to learn it as long as you know you, that you can assign variables or something, then you know enough to get going. Uh, and you could pretend that you're not using Ruby. <laughs> and this is what a Vagrant file looks like. So ignore the first and last line. If you don't, I mean, if you don't care about Ruby, that's just boilerplate you throw in there. But the middle is basically variable assignment, and that's almost what everything looks like in a Vagrant file. Uh, but of course, it is Ruby, so. If you are comfortable with it, you can do some really crazy stuff, you know, depending on environmental variables or platform or whatever you want. There's some pretty crazy things people have done, uh, but it's simple. Uh, here's an example of a slightly more complicated one. Like here's some stuff provisioning with shell scripts. You can see it just like adds on, tacks on. So you commit this thing to version control, and this is kind of the key. Once you commit it to version control, so there's a one-time cost associated with creating it pretty much, like time cost. Um, once the Vagrant file is created, then anyone else gets all the benefits you just made. They basically go to the project, check it out. Vagrant file is already there, so they don't. They just need to know how to use Vagrant. They don't need to know how to set it up or anything, and they run Vagrant up, and then they have their full environment set up. And so it's shared with others. This thing's rarely modified. So once it's set up, like you tell it to configure with Chef or Shell Scripts or Puppet, and those things are modified pretty often. But the actual description of like the machine and how you want to set things up it's really rarely modified. It's not unusual to see a Vagrant file that's unmodified for years. Um, and the latest versions of Vagrant are backwards compatible, if you don't use plugins, um, with Vagrant files from like 0 0.1, it's not mine, uh, from 0 0.1. So there's some people that run Vagrant up on you know, files that are three years old and they still work. And so then the final component is the Vagrant command line. Uh, it manages the entire life cycle of the dev environment, so creation, destruction, SSH access, uh, communication with the VM, it handles, uh, it handles all that. So uh, you don't need to ever, the idea is that you never need to leave the Vagrant command line tool to do anything with your machine. Sometimes you have to if things aren't working correctly, but um, it creates the VM, it hides it from you, so it's, you know, it doesn't show up in your taskbar or anything, and then it gives you access to it. It's Git style, so you do Vagrant and then some sort of commands, and there's a bunch of commands, but there's really only three that anybody needs to know uh, to use Vagrant, and that's up, SSH, and destroy. Uh, up creates the whole environment, just run it. SSH will SSH into it. 
if you need to, and then destroy will just obliterate it from your system like it never existed. And for most developers, most users of Vagrant, that's all they ever need to know, and that's totally fine. But for people setting up Vagrant, configuring it, so on, there's a bunch of other stuff in there. Uh, I think there's like 14 commands total, and then there's some sub commands, sub sub commands, but it's all documented pretty simple, and you know it's, it's based on that command line somewhere. So with these three components, you basically know enough to use Vagrant. Um, if you were to read the docs or learn how to do everything else, anything else, it's just builds on this knowledge. So as long as you understand boxes, a Vagrant file, and then how to run it, you could do anything else with Vagrant, pretty much. And with that, we'll, oh, hey, no, we're going to do a, uh, so with that, let's, let's just see like what a basic workflow is for a developer, um, which we covered kind of in the Tau, but in a, in a more concrete thing. So once we have Vagrant set up, Let's go back to that engineer that got hired to work on the startup. And he's setting stuff up. So now he clones out the app, goes into it, runs Vagrant up, waits probably 10 minutes or something. Um, and then they're ready. And that's like all there is to it. So what's cool about that, though, is that's every project, whether it's you know PHP Rails, whether it's running MySQL, Postgres, or some obscure database, um, it just doesn't matter. It's always the same. And it's you know, expected, basically. It's, there's a lot of people now that put Vagrant on their resume because, and put it on job you know, postings because they know that if you match those up, then they're kind of ready to go in a very quick way. Uh, sync folders uh, mean the developer works within their same editor. So sync folders are what Vagrant sets up so that you edit files on your own laptop and they kind of magically appear within the virtual machine that I'll define what that magic is later. Uh, automated networking means that you just continue to use your browser or you know remote debugging tools, something, um, in order to test the code, pretty much, or run it. Um, that's really nice because the VMs usually run headless, which means you can continue to use you know, Chrome Dev Tools or whatever you need to do to, to work on the site. I don't know when I changed this slide. <laughs> um, but, uh, but of course, sometimes, like as much as Vagrant sets up for you to not have to know Vagrant's there, Sometimes you just need to be in there and, and run stuff. So you just run Vagrant SSH, and it's another bash prompt, or whatever you set up in, in the box. It's just another prompt. So you can just go in there, run tests, or you know whatever you need to do. And then at the end of the day, the three commands. Three, they, you don't need to run all three. They're separate, whatever you want to run. Um, so let's go through a feature rundown. So you know everything Vagrant, cap Vagrant is capable of. Uh, and I won't go too much into detail, just a simple configuration example and how it works, why it's there. So sync folders, really important. They, like I said, automatically sync files from the host to the guest. Uh, the magic underneath depends on what you're using. So if you're using VirtualBox, they'll use VirtualBox shared folders, which are relatively crap. <laughs> There's VMware shared folders for using VMware. They're OK. Um, if you're using like AWS or some remote thing, it'll use rsync. Um, but these are, there's more that are being supported slowly. Uh, there's NFS, uh, SSH, FS is in the works, like some other stuff. So you could just kind of use what's best for you. But for the developer, again, it's transparent. It's just means, it's just a means to an end of transporting files from one place to another without them caring. And setting them up just looks like this. It's a vagrant file thing. You say you want a synced folder. You say where it is on your computer and you see where you want it in the VM. Then there's networking. So that networking configures how you're going to communicate with the VM, or also how VMs are going to communicate with each other. And it gets a little complicated, but there's three. So there's NAT networking, uh, host only networking, bridge networking. They all have their use cases. They're all a little different. Um, mostly when you get started, you only care about NAT networking, which is forwarded ports. You're saying, you know, Apache's running on port 80 on the VM. Make that look like it's actually running on my own computer port 8080. So when you go to localhost 8080, it just shows up, but it's actually networking it through. Um, Host-only networking allows you to create a private network where multiple VMs can talk to each other, and that's useful for distributed systems testing, failure scenarios, stuff like that. Um, and bridge networking makes it appear as a device on your router, and this is really useful um, for when you're doing like mobile testing, because then you can actually load the website on your phone, um, and it looks like it's just an IP that you're hitting on your local intranet or something, but it's actually routing into the VM on your computer. And you can mix and match. So you could use all three, you could use two, you could use whatever you want, you could use multiple of one. 
Um, the networking con config looks like this, and you could have you know n of those things. So you could have many forwarded ports, many private networks, many public networks, all at once, um, just depending on your use case. There's provisioning, so Vagrant out of the box uh, can install and configure software automatically, depending on what systems configuration system you use. So that could be just basic shell scripts, Chef Puppet, CF Engine, recently Ansible, uh, soon Salt out of the box, um, and so on. So basically, whatever you're using, it supports. And if it doesn't, there's probably a plugin to do it. And provisioning, again, it's like a one-line config in the Vagrant file. You tell it what you want and kind of configure it a little bit. And then you run up, and you're up and running. There's multi-machine. Uh, multi-machine manages multiple machines out of uh, a single Vagrant file. So instead of a Vagrant file just being you know, what you want for one thing, it could be a web server, a database server, or if, like, if you're trying you know, a distributed system like Reoc, you could be like, let's spit up a five node cluster. Uh, Reoc uses Vagrant for their demo of like, their distributed systems. The, using the networking features, you could actually configure these VMs to communicate with each other. And this lets you do some pretty crazy stuff, like uh, what happens if the network partitions or appears down? What happens if bandwidth is really low in, in a certain link, but high in another? You know, you can do whatever you want. Uh, yes. And this is what it looks like. Again, it's just basically a single line. Uh, you just say you want a new VM, and then you, you do its own private configuration within each one, and Vagrant will manage the whole thing for you. Uh, and then there's providers, and this is relatively new. This, uh, this is only like three or four months old. Uh, providers are something that manages compute resources uh, for Vagrant, not for virtual machines, for Vagrant. And so in Vagrant 1.0, the only provider was VirtualBox, pretty much. Um, but now that means that you could use VMware, AWS, or whatever. So you run, you have the same configuration, you run Vagrant up, and depending on the provider you specify, it uses that to set, to run things, pretty much. And that's super powerful, because with Vagrant 1.0, it forced you to use VirtualBox all the, all the time. Uh, and VirtualBox isn't great for a lot of environments. There's, there's better tools depending on what you're using Vagrant for or what you want to use Vagrant for. Um, and this basically gives you the flexibility to, to do what you want. So there's some interesting use cases that have popped out of providers. Continuous integration. People tried to force this into Vagrant in 1.0, and it worked reasonably well. Basically, uh, CI to test you know, Chef and Puppet worked properly. Uh, but VirtualBox is pretty crap to run on a server. So CI, it, like, it kernel panics a lot, has all sorts of weird issues. Um, but if you use like AWS provider or LXC provider, it's actually really, really good for Vagrant and CI. It's very fast, very good at parallelizing, stuff like that. Um, and that's unlocked by providers. Uh, again, for consultants, this is really powerful. Um, you could develop locally, so if you have remote clients, you could use VirtualBox to work on your website. Uh, and then you know your clients in Chicago or something, and then you want to show them your work, you can just Vagrant up to AWS, and then in 10 minutes, just be like, here's the public URL, and you can check it out. Um, and that's really awesome. Vagrant in Vagrant is a fun one. People tried this with 1.0, and it doesn't work, because VirtualBox can't run in VirtualBox. But uh, it works now. And it actually has a, it's, it's not just cool. It is cool to see. Um, but it actually has a legitimate use case. So uh, one thing people do is uh, a company that uses Vagrant is Fastly. I don't know if you know them. They're a CDN. Um, but they basically, their dev environment requires something like eight virtual machines. And they used to just give all their developers laptops with a freakish amount of RAM to run VirtualBox, um, a ton of them. Now they switch to using VMware, and what they do is they spin up one giant VMware instance, which has a lot less overhead than eight separate virtual machines. Um, and then within the one giant VMware instance, they install Vagrant again, and then they use eight separate LXC containers. Uh, and they make it work pretty well. It requires some extra tooling, but they make it work pretty well. Uh, but it, also, VMware could run VMware and VMware. So I've tried to go as deep as I can. And I got, I got like seven or eight VMs deep before my computer had no idea what was going on. It was basically just locked. Um, but it was running. <laughs> and, but then I got stuck because it was all on the terminal. And I kept typing exit, and I wasn't sure when I was actually out of it. I just like... <laughs> I got lost. Um, and corporate environments, so this is a legitimate use case. There's a lot of people that didn't adopt Vagrant because they give away you know, like 1% of their annual revenue to VMware, and 
they can't justify giving away that much money and then using virtual blocks. So now these people are like, oh, we could use Vagrant because we could, you know, make up for that, those expenditures. That's real. That's real. Um, and the cool thing with uh, providers is it's the it's same. It's the same Vagrant file, and it works in multiple providers, or should. Um, so you don't need to modify anything, and you just run Vagrant up VirtualBox or Vagrant up VMware, and it does the best it can to do what you want. So uh, one story I always tell is when I was working on the provider stuff, one of the really early um, beta users of the VMware stuff was Yammer. Yammer was like creaking at the edges of VirtualBox. VirtualBox's capabilities. They had 150 developers on Vagrant and VirtualBox, and they're they're growing to 300 or something. This is pre Microsoft acquisition, um, and they needed something better. So I was like, "Well, VMware is better. Um, so let's set you up with that." And I went over there with the beta and installed it. Um, and they're like, "Okay, let's get it. Here's our entire Vagrant setup, everything. Get Yammer running in VMware." And <laughs> I didn't change anything, and then I just ran Vagrant up with VMware, uh, and then. Like 45 minutes through the software provisioning, 30, 45 minutes, it was done. And their manager looked at me and was like, well, we budgeted two weeks uh, of consulting rate for you to finish this. <laughs> and so, of course, they didn't pay me two weeks of consulting rate to do something in 45 minutes. So I kind of like, uh, kind of like hurt myself there financially. But it was cool because they, it like really excited them that it was that easy. And now they're actually off VMware and use AWS. They don't use Azure, which is interesting for them being owned by Microsoft, but they use Vagrant with AWS. And again, that was pretty much almost just a Vagrant up to AWS, almost. And that is pretty magic when you see it. Like you could pull down a project uh, that you did three years ago, run Vagrant up with VMware, and then see it running, and that's pretty wild because it's like some weird time travel crap. Um, and that's it for providers. That's it's it's the same workflow, same configuration. Um, you know, and you have multiple options. And of course, it gets a little deeper than that. Like, there's some capabilities of AWS that VMware doesn't have, um, and vice versa. And Vagrant exposes a way for you to take full advantage of everything providers have to offer. But uh, at its core, at its basic level, you don't need to care about that until you get advanced, pretty much. And you need those sort of things. Uh, and finally, there's plugins. Plugins are a pretty advanced topic, but they're, they could add new commands, provisioners, providers. Most of these providers, are virtu Vagrant still only ships with VirtualBox support. The rest of the providers are plugins, but they're really easy to install. They're just Vagrant plugin install, then something. You use, oh yeah, so it's a, it's a command. Install list on install. Creating plugins. Yeah, I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, so you just use Google to find plugins. Some people get like upset that I don't maintain a wiki or something, but Google is so fast at picking up new Vagrant plugins that it's like, a ridiculous waste of time for me to maintain a wiki because Google picks it up faster. You, you just Google Vagrant X, whatever you want, and if there's a plugin, it's going to be the top thing, like every time, 100% of the time. So just use Google. Uh, so for creating new plugins, uh, the docs has a guide, and actually the book has the best guide right now, and I want to put it in the online docs so you don't have to buy the book for it, but. Uh, the book has like a full like 70 page chapter dedicated to setting up your dev environment, uh, adding any sort of feature to Vagrant, commands, everything, like concrete examples. So there's that. But I do want to pull that just into the docs. Um, it just happened that I was writing the book and was like, well, these docs are crap on creating plugins, so I'm just going to restart everything. Uh, and it turned out a lot better. So yeah, there's the book. That's a pigeon, by the way. The, the, the animal they chose for me was a pigeon which was upsetting to me at the beginning, but then it makes the most sense. It's the most vagrant-like animal I could think of. <laughs> it doesn't have a home or anything. Uh, but kind of what upset me is they lied to me because they sent me the cover and they were like, here's your animal, it's a rock dove, it's beautiful. And I, my response was like one sentence, and I was like, it is a pigeon. <laughs> uh, but I've come to terms with my... Pigeons are Maltese, water, You people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's, a, it's technically a rock dove, but it's a pigeon. <laughs> um, and yeah, that's it. So I didn't cover any of the advanced stuff. I'm happy to talk about it with you, but I think that's a very good overview of why you should be using Vagrant, what it has to offer, how you should be integrating it, um, where it works, why it works, and so on. So here's some links that could get you going on various things. The site has really good docs. Um, Hashicorp basically has nothing worthwhile visiting for. 
then there's the book, and then if you care about VMware, the integration's there. Uh, and that's it. So I think we have Q&A. Questions? Uh, uh. For a second, I almost laser pointed you. Like that would actually do something. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to get uh, David going in our work environment, uh -huh. and I had trouble with kernel panics, as you mentioned. Yeah. And I, this is on Windows and on CentOS. Yeah. I use it on Ubuntu to teach my CF engine classes, and it works great. Cool. Right. So, what would you recommend as a platform? Um. So yeah, kernel panics suck, and VirtualBox does it. Um, so if it's expensive, but then there's VMware for Linux. Um, but if you want to go free or something, LXCs are good. Um, KVM is good if you're running Linux. There's a KVM integration. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I would do. that issue up and it's something that I need to work on a little bit basically being able to define uh, dependency constraints uh, version constraints of Vagrant. Under the hood it's just using Ruby gems so I could basically piggyback on top of their dependency stuff but there's no easy way to do it yet. Readme's, uber readme's. That's what supposed to be away from them. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Uh, it's somewhat, uh, uh, somewhat related question. I, hope. I, I, I don't know if you've heard of Docker I.O. I'm yeah. curious what your opinion is. Do you think it's more of an orthogonal effect of Vagrant? Is it more of a better? Is it something that will work well together? So it, yeah, OK. So if people don't know, Docker is like a tool for managing uh, LXC containers, because uh -huh. managing LXC without Docker really sucks. You get these like thousand line bash scripts. Um, Docker is awesome, and it, it works best with Vagrant. They're working on an integration themselves. Uh, but I mean, it, it's awesome on its own. But it, if you're for the for the Vagrant use case, they're working on integration of Vagrant as a provider, I think. Yeah. A lot of my clients are in the aerospace and defense uh, industry, and their development environments are standalone, so they're air gapped networks. Mm -hmm. And I guess the question that I have is provisioning the development environments. What's it look like? Uh, Taking or keeping a store of the software that you need to provision your environment if you are on an AirGap network using Vagrant. Keeping a store, like a private store of the software? Well, yeah, I guess my question is where, when, when you're specifying the software that's installed by Vagrant, yep. where is it getting it? Okay. And how can I provision that or set it up on a standalone network? Okay, so I mean, the way it works is Vagrant. Vagrant doesn't try to install software on its own, it delegates out to some other system, whether it's CF Engine or Shell Scripts or whatever. So you use the system you're using to install software uh, and configure it to grab it from the private store or whatever you need. Vagrant on its own is, is pretty dumb. It's just like, oh, you want a shell script to run it, or you want Chef to configure it and run it. It doesn't, it doesn't know any deeper knowledge of what's going on. Just a note on that, something to think about, is it may make sense in your environment to build a box with all the software installed, especially because I doubt your software is changing much. Build a, build a box and you basically, you can hand them a USB key yeah. that, you know, you just install the box and they can run Vagrant up and they get a brand new development environment, Vagrant destroyed, it goes away. And yeah, and the box will be on an intranet and stuff. There's no reason for Vagrant to have to talk to the real world. So. Yeah, sadly, USBs are uh, not allowed in this yeah. environment. <laughs> Questions back there is a couple. So, if we're dummies for these, um, if I want to get going, what is the difference between vagrant and setting up a VNDK? Um, 
So a VMDK is pretty nice because that's pretty portable. Um, but a VMDK can't encapsulate a lot of the configuration Vagrant has in terms of, of you know, install software from here, set up. It could do some sort of networking, but it can't do all the networking that Vagrant could do and stuff like that. But at its core, like a pre-baked box with a bunch of software is not very different at all from just the VMDK. All right, so if I had that pre-baked box with some chef, would I be getting the same thing? Well, no, because you wouldn't be configuring, unless you configured it so on boot, it like ran Chef or something. You could do that, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things you could do to, Vagrant doesn't, you know, you don't need to use Vagrant. The Vagrant is just a tool to make things easier to use, make things portable, um, make things work across multiple providers, stuff like that. But there's a lot of people that have, you know, pre-built shell scripts that set up virtual box machines, and they keep using that. But then the big benefit is Vagrant's used by thousands of companies, so you get to benefit from whatever improvements they make or they find in the tool and advancements they make. But if you feel like you don't need that, then you don't need to use it. It, it could be more trouble than it's worth. What's up? So it seems like a lot of the benefit of Vagrant is sort of short-lived uh, boxes. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, code, okay, work, destroy. Um, what about longer-running uh, things? I've seen some people recently talking about like Vagrant Box or something that the same VM will probably exist for months. You see a lot of people using it for like longer running VMs? I don't see a lot of people doing that. I see people trying. It's interesting, but it wasn't the original idea I had in mind, but it's definitely like I'm, I'm watching it to see if there's something interesting there. But at this point, it's not. I mean, it's kind of neat that because of the way the Vagrant file providers work, that you can technically do like a Vagrant up with GitLab and deploy. If you're only using GitLab with like five people, then that's a production instance for you because it probably works pretty well. So you can just vagrant up AWS and be like, I'm done, and then pretend it never happened. But in, in like big orgs and stuff like that, I'm not seeing that happen. And I think that's good. A couple more. I'm just starting a new project, uh, cloud project. So mm -hmm. could you be a little more concrete about how you might set up your local dev environment reflecting what the cloud configuration is going to be like, let's say, on AWS with a multi Yeah. Thing, uh, and how you would then deploy that and what that actually looks like in AWS is that, you know, let's say you want to use their in their, 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 their Unix image. Yeah, uh, at this point, if you want to use like, yeah, if you want to mirror your cloud stuff with a local thing, you need to either create a custom box that matches theirs as closely as possible, or like, if you're using the base uh, Canonical, Canonical actually publishes um, identical AMIs and uh, Vagrant boxes, so you could use those to match if you're using Ubuntu. CentOS is about to start doing that too, um, but you kind of, they're separate things you kind of need to find right now. Uh, and I'm working on some stuff that solves that problem, but it's not done yet, so useless to talk about. Uh, but yeah, at the moment, you just kind of need to manually do it. Yeah. Chris? So one of the problems I run into a lot is I'm constantly switching between bigger environments. So I'll build out a project over here to test this one website we're managing. And then I'll build out this thing because I'm playing with something. And I end up in the situation of, first off, I realize my box is running slow because I've got four bigger boxes uh, running at mm -hmm. one point. Mm -hmm. uh, in a virtual box, which is bad. Um, and then the other problem of, okay, well, I suspend it. And then I come back to it, and it has weird collision issues where you can't talk to it again. Are you working on anything to correct that, or is yeah, that just a, I need to be better at that? No, that? it's a complicated question. It's, it's kind of dependent on VirtualBox, too. So. Um, one, there's a few problems there. One is it's hard to figure out, like, it's easy to forget how many Vagrant VMs are running, and there's no good solution to that right now. Um, the other problem is VirtualBox is really inflexible about suspended VMs. You basically can't change anything. So forwarded ports and stuff. VMware is better in that you can change things. So after it's suspended, Vagrant will actually detect this port's in use. I'm just going to use the next port or, okay. or whatever. Um, and it's just not technically possible with VMware or VirtualBox. Uh, and yeah. yeah, that's pretty much it. I, uh, the third problem is really that there are improvements I can make in VirtualBox to make the detection a little better, uh, but it's pretty rare, so it's low priority. Make sure you use SSDs. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Vagrant works a lot better than this. So I was curious when you were talking about using it remotely, you used the example of Chicago. What if you're using India or Malaysia 
How well does it work internationally? I mean, you could, so, I mean, the providers could be configured to spin up servers anywhere. Yeah, of course, you're going to pay the speed of light costs, no matter what you do. <laughs> I haven't figured that one out yet. But if you're, I mean, if your customer is in Malaysia and you want it to go fast, you should spin up a server in Malaysia. And whether Vagrant's capable of that is up to the provider. Yeah. Cool. And I actually have a question as well. Like, okay. uh, I guess the uh, dependency uh, systems, like we have a PHP composer, I actually haven't seen the plugins. So I guess we can make a plugins for those as well. Yeah, you could do the plugins are really flexible. So. Yes. <laughs> right. Any more questions? Uh, there's two main things that I'm working on that are that are like the two main things before Vagrant 2.0 and stability and stuff. But uh, the main things are uh, building images. I want to make that better. So right now, creating custom boxes is a super manual process, uh, and I'm working on improving that. And in, in the same process, improving the ability to match production closely. Uh, that's pretty much what I've been doing for the past two months, and it's almost done. Uh, and then after that, supporting other guests. So supporting people who use Vagrant with Mac, like VMs and Windows VMs. Um, they get it working, but it's kind of hacky right now. There's a lot of like hoops you have to jump through, and just making the support for those things better, uh, and that's effectively it. You know, continuing to work on the provider stuff, making the providers stable, so you could use Vagrant with anything out of the box. That's that's where it's going. Cool. Thank you very much.